Hello everybody, my name is Bob, and this is my rocket design tutorial. Uh, now, there's a lot, a lot of pe a lot of, you see a lot of comments of people who have questions about how to build a effective rocket to get to the orbit or to get to the moon. Getting to the orbit comes, uh, to, getting to the orbit, <laughs> getting to orbit comes first. Uh, but first, you have to know a little bit about power. Uh, we're going to use a uh, robotic uh, probe just just for uh, this because we don't want to kill and kill a cosmonaut, astronaut, whatever, astronaut, cosmonaut. <coughs> now, uh, the first thing, uh, absolute first thing you need to know about uh, power in a spacecraft is uh, your uh, your thrust to weight ratio. Uh, how much thrust you have to how much weight you're trying to pick up. So uh, this this thing here weighs 2.25. Well, first, all right, first let's look at an engine. Uh, this engine has a very uh, standard engine. Uh, it has um, engine max power of 215. Uh, now divide by 10, and that's how much uh, how much weight it would carry to have a one-to-one -one thrust to thrust to um, uh, weight ratio. So 21 is how much it would be carrying if it had a 1 to 1 thrust to weight ratio. So let's try to put 21 units here. Uh, it's 2.5, 4, 6. Uh, you can probably tell this is not going to work, but just for uh, 8, let's see, let me do a little math right quick. Okay, well, it would, be, it would be nine of these to get a one-to-one -one thrust to weight ratio. Uh, so yeah, it would be uh, 21 weight units. One, two, three, four, <coughs> five, six, <laughs> seven, eight, and nine. There's a, sl a slight fraction over, but uh, we got to take you to affect uh, that that thing. So, uh, and um, let's see, let me pop one of these on here just to power things up. Okay, now if I put this on the end of it, that's a one-to-one -one thrust to weight ratio. Uh, now, do you think this is going to take off? Let's find out. Uh, I, I also want to put these guys on here for a quick test of something I want to show you. Put these guys here, but we'll put it on a different stage so that it's not firing at the same time as that, that engine. Okay. <coughs> One thing that you uh, probably ought to have for, whoops, uh, most of your rockets, if you want them to not fall over on the launch pad, uh, is uh, under uh, structural uh, these guys will go with four. Now this is the symmetry. That's how, how many times that's going to be repeated. So that's you have it on four. So, you know the, the cross shaped four that gives you four of these things. Uh, down here I had it set to six or eight, so it gave me eight, six or eight of those. That was eight. Okay. So now this uh, should be about a one to one thrust to weight ratio. Uh, do you think it's going to take off? Let's find out. Uh, let's see, let's name it Failboat. Save. And launch. Oops. Uh, this should be uh, uh, also a. Uh, a good lesson, uh, something that I often forget to do, is check your staging. Make sure that everything over here is set up in the order that you want it to fire. Uh, so this is the, it goes from the highest number uh, upwards. So um, uh, number two in this case will be the uh, first stage burn. Uh, then number one, these things will release. And then um, uh, number zero, uh, these things will kick in. And I have those there for a reason. Uh, and let's uh, let's uh, save and launch. Let's 
Now, I may uh, just this uh, this lesson is not going to work, <coughs> but this is about a one to one thrust to weight ratio. Okay, we're going to throttle all the way up. We need every little bit of power that we can get here. Uh, we'll put SAS on, even though we don't have it SAS. That's that's something for a later a later uh, chapter. Uh, let's uh, hit the ignition. I'm using uh, the button that says it's just stage. And it just kind of hovers there. Yeah. Now if we hit it stage again, see these things give it enough thrust to go ahead and go go on. But that's uh, without these, that was at a, about a one to one thrust to weight ratio. And I was, uh, I mean, I, I was surprised to see that this would actually have a one to one ratio with all these. Uh, now, obviously, uh, one to one thrust rate to weight ratio is not what you want if you want a rocket that's really going to take off, uh, because that's that's what it was before these rock little rockets kicked in. Now, now it's got a higher than one to one ratio uh, because those rockets kicked in. Um, let's see if we can hit the vehicle itself. Somebody building here. Yeah. Oh. Uh, that's also uh, uh, something I, I should uh, uh, should mention when we come to uh, control. Uh, is uh, uh, it is handy to know sort of which way is the the, the forward direction of your spacecraft. Uh, and I will I will talk about that when I get to more to control issues. Right now we're just talking about power. Uh, and with these little e extra engines, it actually exceeds a one to one ratio and is able to take off. Without those engines, it was at a one to one ratio and it was just kind of hovering there. Wasn't really taking off, wasn't really, uh, wasn't hit, hit the ground like, like it is now. Booyah! <laughs> okay. Uh, people, someone, be, someone building? Okay, so one to one ratio is not what you want. What you want is at least a two to one ratio uh, and preferably more like a three to one ratio of power to weight. Uh, so let's see. Uh, this is nine, so divided by divided by three. Believe it or not, my math is not not the best in the world. Um, uh, so each one should these should have three, right? So that would be a third, uh, three to one power ratio. So one, two, three. Hit that. Okay, this is a three a three to one power ratio. That's pretty much what you want. You can go with a two to one, uh, but Three to one would be the, the ideal, and you could even go more than three to one uh, if you if you're you know, if you're able to uh, swing that, or or if you're using certain little tips and tricks, um, like for instance um, uh, jet engines. You can you can I've I've gotten a very simple manned spacecraft going like bats out of hell on uh, jet engines uh, as a first stage. So uh, let's see structural. Okay. Now this is a, about a, a three to one weight uh, weight to thrust ratio. It has three times as much thrust as it has weight to, to carry. So build up two and launch. Okay, wait for the physics to kick, it, to kick in. Okay. Uh, and launch. Okay, and you can see that, that uh, as versus just hovering there, uh, it's getting along quite nicely. Uh, and you can right click on the tanks to, uh, to see what your, uh, what your fuel uh, situation is like. Uh, now it's, uh, it drains from the top down. Now, um, <clears throat> you know, there's one thing that you may want to uh, uh, notice, which is this this craft is not very controllable. I do have some fins on it. It's it's just not. You know, one thing it has three fins, not four fins. That's not an ideal scenario. Uh, secondly, it's kind of hard for me to tell which way is up here. If I'm looking at the, at the spacecraft, if I'm looking at the spacecraft, it's hard for me to tell. Now, if I look down here, I can tell very easily because this is top, that's bottom. So now it's pointing down. Or well, more was. Now it's pointing up. And now it's spinning around, but uh, so uh, you get the general general gist of it. 
Uh, the brown uh, represents Earth over here. Brown represents Earth. Blue represents sky. Now uh, that also applies for, for things that don't really have a blue sky. Uh, just for instance, if you were in solar orbit, uh, brown represents the direction to the sun. Uh, blue represents the direction away from the sun. Uh, so as you can say, tell, we have some real control issues here. Uh, and uh, and partially is that this, this triple symmetry not really good for control. It, it'll work, but it's just not really good. Also, that the type of engine can have an effect on your control, but that's that's for a later part of this uh, in flight. flight. Vehicle assembly building. Okay, so <coughs> we have this very rudimentary rocket. Uh, we could probably put. We don't probably don't have to have absolutely a three to one ratio on it. Uh, let's do this. Okay, and notice out there is where the launch pad is. We're going to do something right quick. Uh, we're going to stick this one antenna right here where we can see it. Uh, the reason why I'm doing that is uh, that way if you're not looking at the nav ball, if you're looking at the ship, you can tell which way you're going. Because sometimes you may be uh, looking at the your, your, your ground and going, oh, I need to go this way. But you may not know what direction that is on the nav ball or whatever. Anyway, to <clears throat> keep you from getting confused, uh, I like to put a little indicator here that sort of shows me which way is the sort of top or uh, you know, top end of the spacecraft. So if you uh, are, are going, you're using your um, your uh, down your dive button, uh, it'll go this end this way. Uh, or if you're 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 pitching up, uh, it'll uh, do the opposite of that. Uh, and same for for y'all and all that. Now that that is the I probably should mention that that is the three axis of um, of movement. Uh, there is pitch, which goes this way, this way, and this way. Okay. There's yaw, which goes this way and this way. And there's roll, which goes this way. It spins basically spins around its axis. Uh, that's that's roll. Uh, let's put on four four of these for better control. And now we can tell quite easily uh, which which end is the uh, uh, which end is up? Which which end? Say if we had a cockpit on our our, our spacecraft, that's where the canopy would be, and that that can give you a, a good visual aid to seeing if you're if you want to pitch down, pitch up, you know, y'all y'all left or right, or roll. It gives you a good visual indicator of where your ship is as versus the nav ball. Uh, now you can always tell where you're going by using the nav ball, but sometimes you may be landing, you may have to be focusing your attention somewhere else, and it's good to have that. So. Uh, let's see. Also, uh, let's uh, talk about. Well, no, no, no. Let's not, let's not get sidetracked. Okay, so you've got you've got this rocket, uh, and you want to you say you want to. Well, that's fortunately that rocket's not going to get us to orbit, is it? No, it's not. But let's say we uh, add some more of the same thing to it. Okay, I'm going to change my symmetry to two. Bilateral symmetry. No firsts, actually. I'm going to copy that. If you go to go Alt click, that allows you to copy something. And we're going to put two of these items here, here, and slap that on there. Okay. Uh, now we have um, three of the. All of these are a little shorter. Uh, we have uh, three of that, that same thing, so it should get us sort of like three times farther. Not really, but sort of. Um, okay, but uh, uh, how do you how do we, how do we want to make the best optimal most optimal optimal use of these new boosters? Uh, well, there's a, a couple of good principles in uh, rocket design. Uh, one of those principles is um, to use as ma use as many of your uh, rockets. Uh, have, have, use, have, be firing as many of your engines at the start as you can. Now, obviously, there you're going to have second stages and stuff. But uh, if anything, anything except for the, the final terminal stage of your rocket, if you have a r rocket engine on it, you want want it to be firing. So, for instance, let's let's say this right quick. Uh, let's let's do a new one just for an example. Uh, we'll use a robotic. Probe. What you probably don't want to be doing 
is something like this. Okay, so what you have you have this first stage uh, burns and drops, second second stage burns and drops, and finally the third stage burns and drops. Uh, and while this stage is going, of course this won't, this won't even take off the ground. But um, uh, when this go this one is going, uh, this this engine is uh, is not functional. It's not doing anything for you, and neither is this engine. So now you're you're going to probably have a third stage engine like this. Um, but uh, aside from that, every other engine that you have on the ship. Uh, if you have it on the ship, probably needs to be firing its jets at launch. So um, that's one thing. Oh, also one thing I, I don't have. This is a very important thing to use in your designing your rocket. Uh, if you're going to have separate stages, you've got to have decouplers. What it does is it allows you to separate the old used-up parts of your rocket, uh, so that they're not dragging down the rest of your rocket. Uh, so that's a that's a decoupler. That's a very useful thing to have. So let's go ahead and go back to our, uh, let's see, oh, I guess failed boat tree. Boat. Okay, so we're building, trying to build a um, rocket with um, uh, sound design principles here. Uh, and, uh, okay, our first main stages here, uh, they're all firing, going to be all going to be firing at the same time, so that's good. Let's move that there, so they will be firing at the same time. Yep. Okay, that's good. How can we, how can we improve this better? Well, okay, as it stands now, uh, these guys are going to drop off, are going to run out of fuel just very shortly before this thing does. Uh, it's not all that efficient. Uh, if you have, this is a fuel line, let's suppose we, let's change symmetry to bilateral. Uh, let's suppose we uh, put this up here. And now, uh, this engine is going to suck down from these external tanks just like these two engines are. And it's going to use the, this fuel here uh, before it uses the fuel that's in, in its own column, right? Uh, so um, uh, that means that that once it's, uh, once the rocket is no longer having to carry all this fuel, it just drops off those extra engines and goes on its own way. And it'll, that's one engine will have plenty of thrust to to lift up this column of uh, engine here. Uh, now let's uh, take it one more one step further. Uh, the idea here is we are uh, dumping stuff off as soon as we're not not using it anymore. As soon as we don't need it, and we're going to do another stack like this. And like that. Okay. And uh, now uh, we could do the same thing here that we did here, which is hook this up to that. Uh, unfortunately, that means that these four will all drop at the same time. They'll all run out of fuel at the same time. Um, so it'll, it, in the meantime, it's going to be carrying a lot of dead weight. Uh, so instead of hooking this up to this, uh, instead of hooking this up to this, to the main main core stage, what we're going to do is we're going to hook it up to here. So, uh, that kind of looks retarded, doesn't it? Let's try it different. Uh, so what will happen is this guy will run out of fuel. Uh, doesn't need that engine anymore to, to lift up all that heavy fuel, so that engine will drop away. And make sure that this this set is a set to, to drop first. Right now our staging is all screwed up, and that's something that uh, is very easy to uh, overlook is staging. I do it almost every time, uh, but you gotta, got to uh, focus on your staging. So all these engines should be going at the same time. And that's our, that's the that's our principle of everything except for your final stages all has to be burning at once. If you got if you have a rocket engine, uh, you probably need to go ahead and fire it at liftoff. Matter of fact, you could probably even go to an absurd length and even have the, uh, the the final orbital stage firing at the same time too, if you really wanted to. Um, so now what will happen is this will run out of fuel. It no longer needs this thrust to hold up this big old column of fuel, so this will drop off. Uh, 
And this, and meanwhile, th th when that drops off, this, this, and this will all be, be full of fuel, because uh, this one is feeding into this. And then this one will start to drain. Uh, this engine and, and these engines will all be feeding off the side tanks. Then when this is done, it'll drop off too. And then this engine is quite sufficient to carry the rest of it to uh, to orbit. Uh, now, now, this is one kind of decoupler here. Uh, that's, the, that's a side decoupler. Uh, now, um, we probably want to have uh, a little final stage to, uh, to send our little package to orbit. Let's go ahead and... Nope, that's the big one. I always get those two confused. Okay. Little orbital stage. Uh, now, there's also other figures on these engines that you should be aware of. Uh, one of them is specific impulse. Uh, the same rocket engine won't be as efficient uh, at sea level as it is at the vacuum. So, for instance, for this one, the LV-909 engine, uh, ISP at sea level is 300. Not great. Uh, I mean, there's worse, but it's not great. Uh, ISP in vacuum, though, is 390. That's quite good. Uh, not as good as nuclear, but it's, it's quite good. That's why it's very often used for upper stages and stuff such like that. Uh, so, uh, ISP uh, is uh, specific. Uh, spe spe <laughs> specific impulse. Um, now, what is specific, specific impulse? Uh, basically, that's a measure of how much propulsive energy you're getting out of each kilogram of fuel. Uh, so, uh, for instance, for this one, uh, the ISP in vacuum is three, 390. Um, so, um, that's a measure of how much power uh, you're getting out of each kilogram of fuel. Uh, if you switch to here, um, this one's uh, uh, ISP in vacuum is 370, which is also still pretty good. Uh, but its ISP at sea level is 320, which is much better than this one. Uh, so you have to be aware that um, uh, that uh, engines are going to be uh, fuel wasteful of fuel uh, more so at certain altitudes than at others. Uh, this is this is a fairly well-rounded engine that's pretty decent in at sea level and at vacuum. Uh, this one much better in vacuum than at sea level. Uh, now let's look at a nuclear engine. Uh, nuclear engine, uh, ISP at sea level is 220, which sucks. Um, a nuclear engine has really bad, th this nuclear engine has really bad uh, efficiency at sea level. Um, real nuclear engines are even probably even worse at sea level. Uh, uh, specific, specific impulse in vacuum though, 800 as versus 390 a year. 800, more than twice as good. Um, th th that's, this is a type of engine uh, very often used for interplanetary stages that is very efficient in the way it uses fuel. Uh, it's extremely efficient in that respect. Um, now, what's, what's of all these engines here, which is the actually the most, most efficient? Um, we have the jet engine here. Uh, it's and it's ISP at sea level of 800, ISP at vacuum, I don't even know how that works, at, of 1200. Uh, so that's a very, very efficient engine. The reason why it can be so efficient is it doesn't use the oxidizer. You don't have to carry along liquid oxygen uh, uh, to make it work. Um, it's, um, uh, it uh, sucks in air from the atmosphere, which means it doesn't work too great if you don't have the atmosphere. Uh, but if for, for like first stages, I've used turbojet engines a lot. They're very good. Okay, so we have our, our little booster stage here. We're going to put a decoupler on it. So we can separate it from the rest. Uh, and we'll pop that there. Now, are we done? No, not really, but we're going to go ahead and launch it anyway. Uh, well, what, actually, one thing we need to get go ahead and have uh, before we worry about anything else is we need to get uh, some... Oh, we got, we got power. We got that thing. Okay, so we're good for power. Uh, now this is not a finished rocket yet, uh, but I'm going to show you sort of what's what it's like uh, the, uh, this way. We go ahead and put um, put some pins on it. That is for control in the atmosphere. Obviously, it doesn't work in a vacuum. Uh, that's why you'll see fins on first stage and like real rockets. Uh, sometimes you'll see uh, fins on first stage, but you won't see them on any upper stages because Unless it's designed to work when the first stage is, is operating, because you, it doesn't work. They don't work in a vacuum, obviously. Their wings, they don't work in a vacuum. Uh, 
Uh, okay, now we're going to go ahead and uh, this 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 rocket is going to have issues, but I want to use it as a lesson of sorts. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and launch it. We got our little supports there, and we want to have them set up to operate at the same time that the uh, engines ignite. If you're using uh, if you're using uh, jet engines as the first stage. You want to actually have them se separate later because it takes a while for jet engines to spool, spool up. So if you're using jet engines for your first stage, uh, you, you need to be able to turn the, the engines on and then after a, a minute or after a few seconds, then let these go. So otherwise it'll just flop on the ground and be very unpleasant. Okay, let's uh, save this as failed boat 4. Save and launch. I don't know if I've uh, told you this uh, thus far. I probably have, but uh, this kind of staging is called asparagus staging. In other words, where where uh, it'll say uh, it'll um, suck the fuel out of uh, two strap-on boosters, drop them, suck the fuel out of two two strap two more strap-on boosters, drop them, and so on. Uh, so power to maximum. SAS on, even though we don't have an SAS. And three, two, one, go. And we see that our thrust is very respectable because each each of these fuel columns has enough thrust attached to it to get it um, get it moving. Now, as long as we're going uh, straight up, everything's fairly well peachy keen. <coughs> now, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at our fuel. That one's almost dry. It's sucking down and get rid of it. Uh, and we screwed up the staging. <laughs> that's that's I, like I say, I do it every practically every time. I screw up the staging. That's it's not uh, not a good thing, but it does happen. Okay, so this should be first by itself, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then this should be separate. It's not the end of the world if you screw up your staging yet. Now, when they start having campaign mode and you wind up having to buy these rockets after you screwed them up, uh, it could be a, more of an issue. But for right now, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but uh, it's always good to check your staging, like I didn't do then. Okay, save and launch. Okay, wait for the physics to kick in. And it's kicked in. Throttle to maximum. Uh, you want to check in your uh, keys and see where, you, which, where your throttle key is. Uh, liquid engines won't work without the throttle. Uh, solid engines will work regardless. So if you light them up, they're, they're, they don't have a throttle. They're just going to go at maximum speed until they drop. Okay, SAS on, even though we don't have an SAS. And it's just good practice to get into. And three, two, one, go. Okay, and again, we're getting plenty of good acceleration here. Okay, and the first stage that's going to drop is going to be these. And sucking down that tank real quick. And it's going to suck down that one. And like I say, as long as it's going straight up, it's not giving us any problems. Or not much of a problem. Okay, those engines are dead. Drop them. Okay, and you may notice that we are uh, deviating a little bit from straight up and down. We can uh, adjust that. Yeah, still deviating a little bit. Uh, and you see right here, this is our indicator of sort of where the top of the spacecraft, the top forward of the spacecraft is, of the rocket is. Okay, now uh, as we go up, we're going to have more and more troubles with control because. Well, one we just we just have those, these two fins left, but even if we had four fins, we uh, uh, fins don't really work this high up. Okay, we're gonna try to do our gravity turn. The gravity turn is basically uh, you don't need you don't you don't need only uh, forward, and it's just uncontrollable. Uh, you don't only need forward uh, velocity when you're doing a rocket. 
you also need a lot of horizontal velocity. In other words, um, yeah, and then right now it is it's just, I, I can't control it at all. And it's absolutely uncontrollable. Because these fins don't work now this high up. Okay. We'll just go with it. But you see, we're still getting very good uh, acceleration. So our weight to thrust ratio is still quite good. And we're, we're, we're cooking. Uh, we're up apogee of, uh, or apsis of 135,000 uh, meters. So if we had control over this, there's no question that we would have uh, have orbit. And of course, we don't have control over this at all. <laughs> it's just a dumb projectile at this point. And that music tells us we're in space. Uh, the beginning of space set here is uh, 70,000 meters. And it's just going to blow us into deep space here. And we're already at uh, almost 300,000 meters. Uh, if we had controlled this, we would be able to turn this uh, uh, horizontal and get a circular orbit. Right now, what's going to happen is it's going to go up here and it's going to smash back, back down to Kerbin, unless it reaches Kerbin escape, in which case it will go out into a solar orbit, which is altogether possible. Yeah, it's, it's probably going to head out to solar or orbit at this point, <laughs> uh, or at least a very high, high orbit. And uh, again, I have no control over what it's doing at all. Absolutely, I, I can control spin a little bit, but uh, aside from that, I have no control. Uh, SAS, if I had an SAS module, and this is going to be in our section in control, if I had an SAS module, I might be able to actually do something with that, but we don't have an SAS module, so it's not going to do a damn thing. So I have thrust, I have power, definitely. I have no control. I have an abundance of power. Uh, and we are going way out. Uh, unfortunately though, it is also uh, not controllable. All right. Let's look for our little indicator of what, uh, what size is up, what side is up. Uh, let's switch our view to chase. That means it'll just do like that. Uh, and uh, let's see if we can get it pointed back in the direction of our travel. The direction of our travel is indicated by this little um, circle and sort of semi-cross shaped um, thing here. And we're just spinning right past it. Uh, this is why we have, we're have we going to do a separate issue, on, a separate uh, section of this video on control, because control is also part of the part of the whole equation. And we're out almost to the orbit of the moon if we'd been lined up right, uh, but we have no control. Uh, now the uh, the little uh, this little module has a certain amount of uh, um, directional control to it. Uh, it's not uh, not enough to keep this whole rocket going the right way. Okay, it looks like we are starting to turn back around. I mean, it looks like I might be exerting some minor amount of control over this thing. I'm gonna go ahead and burn this out and see if it sends us into solar orbit. Okay, now it's out of fuel. Uh, a separate issue, I might should, might should put that up here, <coughs> is um, what do you do with your space junk? Now you can actually use, uh, uh, use the interface to delete it, but if, let's say, if you're, you're wanting to play more realistically, uh, you may want to uh, think about how you're going to deorbit your space junk so it doesn't hit something. Although space is awful big, uh, so actually the odds, I've, ha I've had, um, I've been hit by space junk like once in all my playing KSP. Uh, let's activate this engine. Or I can hit P or P on my, my to activate the engine. It's, it's gonna that's not the default key. I, I set the keys up my own way. Uh, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and fire this off. 
and we are in solar orbit. We are heading towards solar orbit. So we have left. We have left Kerbin behind. We are heading towards Eve. It looks like. Oh no, we're heading out. That's increasing. We're heading out to the deep outer. This is the new planet Elo they've, they've come up with. So okay, if you're wanting to get to uh, to orbit, what we did is probably not good. And and what what was the problem? The problem was control. We had no control. So control is another another aspect. Uh, power is one aspect. Control is another aspect. Uh, you have to be able to control your ship to get it to where you want it to go. Uh, now where the hell is this thing going? Going out to dress? What it looks like? It's going out a long way, isn't it? In any case, <laughs> it's going out somewhere far. Yeah, it looks like it could be on a course for dress. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, so we had the power. Uh, power is okay. We solved the power problem, uh, but we have not solved the control problem. Okay, so how can we go about uh, solving the control problem? Uh, now these veins, these uh, uh, winglets, uh, they'll solve the problem for a little bit if you want to be riding herd on it the whole time. Uh, that's probably not what you really want to do. Let's move this up here. Okay, there's a there's a uh, there's a tab here called control. It's a very important tab to uh, know about. Uh, one of those things in the tab called control is an advanced SAS module. What does that do for you? Um, it's assuming that you have the resources to control your ship, it keeps it on a constant heading. Uh, so, for instance, on this rocket, uh, it's at a certain point it wasn't it would would not have done us any good. Uh, why is that? Because it doesn't have the... this rocket has no power with which to control its trajectory. If you're out in space, uh, having wings like airplanes do uh, to try to control your, your attitude, uh, your direction you're pointed, doesn't really work. Uh, so you're going to need to have some means of uh, controlling uh, your attitude, the direction in which you are pointed. Uh, now, let's look at th these engines. Uh, these engines are just straight up, straight up and down, bolted on. Uh, you just, uh, they just go. They don't have any ability to steer themselves. Uh, now these engines have uh, what's called thrust vectoring. They can steer, and that's the way that uh, real, most real rocket engines, uh, for the most part, um, well, not all of them, but uh, a lot, a lot of rockets um, uh, are set on what's called gimbals, which allow the uh, the engine itself to be pivoted back and forth, up and down, uh, to uh, adjust the the uh, attitude, the, the direction that the spacecraft or rocket is pointing. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to put this right here. It will help us to uh, control the attitude. So we're, we're moving on to issues of control. Uh, so that will help. Uh, and when we come back, I will, I'm going to go take a short break. Uh, when we come back, we will delve into control in greater detail. Okay, and now we move on to our second section, which is deals with control. Uh, now you'll say I've got this uh, SAS module on here. That's a control module. It's designed to help you control your rocket, right? So if I've got that on there, it should be all peachy keen, right? No. Uh, the SAS only helps you to control an otherwise controllable rocket, a rocket that you could control on manual if you really wanted to. Um, and you can manually control your rocket if you want to, but um, using the SAS... Uh, which keeps you on a steady heading is much easier, but SAS will not c control an, uncontro an otherwise uncontrollable rocket. It just won't do it. Uh, so now I have this uh, engine down here. You see it's different from the other ones. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's a thrust vectoring engine, which means it's steerable. So that should solve our control problems, right? No, not necessarily. Let's take a look at the center of mass. This is the center of balance for your... Well, first, let's Let's think about uh, the relationship of power to control this way. Let's say you're going to cut an onion with a knife, uh, but your hand has neither power nor control. Well, it's just going to flop there useful, uselessly and uh, not do anything. Let's suppose it has 
uh, power, but no control. Your hand has power, but you can't direct it. You're going you're gonna to be chopping up everything, stabbing your neighbors or whatever, but you're not going to be able to, able to cut the onion. If your hand has power and control, you can slice the onion. And the same way with rockets. If, you're, if you have a rocket that has enough power, uh, that is able, able to be controlled through all the stages of its flight. Uh, now remember these wings? They can control it when it's in the, in the atmosphere. They can't control it in space. Uh, so if you have a rocket that is controllable uh, and through all aspects of its flight, flight program uh, and has enough power to get there, then you have a winning rocket. So power plus control. So how can I make this rocket more controllable? Okay, so the only right, right now the only steering mechanism we have that will actually work in a vacuum is this rocket, this engine right here. Uh, let's take a look at our center of mass. That's this little button over here. Um, okay, well that's sort of reasonably far away from the center of mass, but it could be better. Uh, let's ima imagine that you had a, um, a wrench and you're trying to uh, unscrew a r rusty bolt with this wrench, uh, but that, the wrench has a very tiny little handle. Uh, you're not going to do too well uh, as compared if you have a wrench with a big long handle, you can apply some leverage. Uh, the same thing applies here. Uh, the further this thing is from the center of balance, the better it's going to be able to steer this rocket. So let's go ahead and move this up near the top. Uh, make sure we have our tubing set up right. And the same thing over here. Okay. Uh, and now this is uh, further away from the center of balance and should have more leverage uh, over the over the uh, at the attitude, the direction that the spacecraft is going, the way you're pointing it. That's that's what attitude is. That's what we call attitude. Uh, now, uh, there's one problem with using this engine for attitude control, which is it doesn't work if the engine is off. <coughs> Excuse me. That's why you'll see a lot of a lot of people who have. Uh, really big moon rockets um, kind of won't be able to turn their engines off because they have to have their engines to, to, to be able to steer the thing and uh, without the, without the rocket the engines going it's uncontrollable uh, so assuming that we want to have some control over it uh, when the engines aren't going uh, let's put what's called uh, a reaction control system on it let's change our symmetry to four-sided quadrilateral, quadrilateral. Uh, and we'll put some for these uh, RCS. Uh, it's called monopropellant tanks. Um, it's basically it's you may you may have seen uh, pictures of the uh, Apollo spacecraft that had these little things on the side that had little nozzles sticking out. Uh, or if you imagine that that, that you had uh, if you're if you're uh, letting go of a balloon uh, and you had uh, little little flaps on the balloon that could open or close to let out gas to steer the balloon. As it's flying around, that's sort of almost sort of what what this is. It's, it's um, not a very efficient um, form of propulsion. Oh, well, actually, it, it can be. They they just had to dumb the RCS down because it was actually a little too efficient. Uh, but what it can do is it can help steer your spacecraft. Uh, but these tanks uh, that hold the monopropellant for the RCS system won't work if you don't have RCS thrusters. Uh, you probably should have uh, four of them for each set. So we'll put four there. And uh, in, in most cases, if you have a small spacecraft, you can get away with just having one set. Uh, but for a rocket, you probably want to go with two sets, at least two sets. Maybe more. Um, now one thing that's uh, kind of different about um, the RCS system, the monopropellant, is uh, you can stick these thruster blocks anywhere and it will still feed off these same tanks. Uh, so that's good if you don't have to worry about plumbing, you know, how the plumbing works on that. Uh, it can be bad if you're, if you're trying to save some RCS for an, up, on an upper stage that, and it's getting all sucked down by the lower stage, but that's a different issue. Um, so now we have an RCS system, so even when this engine is off, we can still kind of maneuver the uh, spacecraft around, especially after we drop these stages, uh, which they should probably be, be dropped um, long before we even need that. Um, now, um, what was I about to say? I was about to say something profound and important, but I forgot what it was. Uh, uh, let's see. 
Oh, uh, yeah. Um, now, you may be thinking, well, RCS is a great thing. I should have it on all the time. No, you shouldn't. You should only have RCS on when you absolutely positively need it and can't steer your, your spacecraft any other way uh, because you only have a fairly finite amount of RCS fuel. These RCS tanks are fairly heavy. Um, so, although they're probably pretty generous with um, uh, the RCS, really, compared to probably the way real spacecraft work, um, you only want to have the RCS on when you absolutely, positively can't steer the spacecraft any other way. Uh, and you need to turn it off right after you're done using it. Because otherwise it'll just start sucking down your, your RCS fuel. Especially if you have SAS on, it'll start using the RCS fuel minor tiddly little adjustments and you'll soon be out of RCS and you don't want that. So only have the RCS on when you absolutely positively need it. If you have this engine on, in this case, uh, you don't need the RCS on because this engine can steer you. Okay, now we have a, uh, a rocket. Uh, one thing you may note uh, is uh, we have this uh, power system on here. Um, if you have a, a command module, uh, a, someone with a person in it, it can steer itself without power. Uh, but if you have a robotic probe of some kind, you absolutely positively have to have power. Otherwise it will stop running. Uh, now, I usually uh, pretty generous with the batteries. Batteries are uh, ways you can store your pad power, uh, say if you had solar panels, you can store your pad power uh, during times when you're in the sunlight, uh, and later on, when you're not in the sunlight, you can uh, you can uh, run off batteries. And the batteries uh, don't weigh very much, and they have a lot of, uh, a lot of power relative to the needs of this little spacecraft. Uh, if you ha are running things like <coughs> lights, let's say you want to put a light on here. If you're running lights, that also uses power. Um, so uh, that's another another aspect of spacecraft, which is power, especially important on robotic spacecraft like this. Uh, okay, I think we're ready to uh, launch this thing. Uh, I could put a nose cone on here just to make it pretty. Uh, thing is, I don't see any kind of uh, I don't I don't think it necessarily makes a big difference. Well, we'll put we'll put some nose cones on here just to make it pretty. Okay, uh, now our next objective is to get this package uh, to orbit. Let's say this as the failboat five. Okay, and let's check our staging. That's down there where it should be. This is not where it should be. It should be firing at the same time as the other engines. Okay. Uh, this should drop first, and it does. This should drop second, and it does. And then this should decouple. That's not quite straight. Okay. Make sure all our plumbing is good the way it should be. Now, uh, one last thing before we go to launch. Uh, it can be a good idea to uh, reinforce your spacecraft with these things called strut connectors. Uh, depending on the um, size of your spacecraft, they may or may not be necessary. Uh, they do, um, even sometimes when they're not necessary, they do uh, improve uh, stability uh, because you don't have parts of your spacecraft all wobbling around doing their own thing, <laughs> you know, doing the shimmy. Uh, so um, it can be a good thing to have struts. Uh, you don't necessarily need to go overboard with them, depending on what kind of rocket you've got. Uh, now, now, if your if your rocket is falling apart in flight, then that could be an indicator that you need more struts. Uh, so you may also hear this be, being called space tape sometimes. Uh, okay, save. Check check our staging one more time. Okay, looking good. All right, let's uh, launch our satellite into orbit. Correct combination of power. We know we have the power because we tested this general configuration before. Uh, and control. Now, initially, we're de de depending totally on this little engine to help control us. Once we get into space, we can use RCS. 
Okay, and then now we will turn the SAS on. Uh, this is the SAS module. Uh, what that does is, is it keeps it automatically controls the rocket so that it keeps on the same heading. This is your heading. This is where your direction you're going. Okay, throttle up. SAS on, and three, two, one, go. Okay, in this initial boost phase, uh, we have some control by by means of these fins. Uh, that's not going to last once we get to space, though. All right, sucking down the fuel big time. Uh, getting ready to drop our first set of boosters. And drop. Hasta la vista. And right, now we're continuing on. Uh, and this engine is also feeding off of the, these tanks. So, uh, Right now we're at 6,000 meters. Uh, like every sensible space program, things are done in metric. Uh, so uh, uh, we're doing things in meters here. Uh, and uh, at about 13,000 meters, we're going to start tilting over. Why are we going to do that? Because uh, simply going up is not what you need to go to orbit. You need as, as much or more horizontal speed. Actually, you need more horizontal speed. Um, okay, we're at 13,000. Let's go ahead and turn SAS off, because otherwise it'll stick, make a stick in place. Turn SAS off, tilt it over, uh, get on a 90 degree heading about halfway over, and turn SAS back on again. Um, uh, we're tilting over because we need to get uh, even more horizontal speed than we need than we need vertical speed. We need vertical speed too, of course. Uh, but uh, in order to actually get in orbit, uh, we're going to need to have horizontal speed. Uh, and you see our horizontal speed is increasing there. Uh, we're also we have a fair, quite a fair altitude building up here. Okay, and we've lost boosters. Let's drop them off. Uh, that's see how close that came. Uh, that could be an issue. Uh, there's these things called sepatrons uh, that can help that out. Okay, we're at seventy thousand, just over seventy thousand meters. Seventy thousand meters is, is above the atmosphere. That's all we need to be. Now you may want to be higher than that, but all we need to be is at seventy thousand meters. However, as you, as you see, we're going to just fall right back down. So turn SAS off. And see, right now we have no, almost no control. I'm, I'm trying to tilt it over as hard as I can to get it over here and it's just not working. So we're going to turn RCS on, our reaction control system. That's going to help us out, get us tilt, tilt it over. We're going to tilt it over totally sideways. Actually a little bit more because we're right now we're pointed this way. Um, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm going in advance of what it's showing me. Okay, and I have RCS off, uh, SAS on. Uh, and we'll go ahead and fire it up. You see, th these were, 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 until just recently, totally full. Uh, so we got plenty of fuel. Uh, this is our apoapsis. This is the high point of our orbit. We want to get uh, get cooking uh, sideways long before we get there. So when the apoapsis reads about um, 45 seconds, uh, you need to be move, need to be moving now. Okay, even even so, we're we're, re we're reaching our apoapsis pretty quick here. So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm I'm pointing the spacecraft upwards. I guess it's more altitude and more time to increase our sideways motion. And see, while the engines are running, it's perfectly steerable. It's only when the engine engines aren't running that I have a problem. Uh, also, that engine is not very powerful. That's part part of why reason why. We were coming up on our apoapsis so quick. You want to keep the apoapsis ahead of you, um, because uh, otherwise you'll start heading down and you'll start having all kinds of problems. You won't be able to make orbit. So keep the apoapsis ahead of you, uh, unless you're unless you're about to to reach orbit right then. Okay, now it's after about 38 uh, seconds away. We're going to go ahead and uh, turn the RCS on if we want to steer the thing. Uh, RCS off. Now we're gonna go wait, go ahead and wait a little bit until uh, we get to about 20 seconds before we start burning again. Uh, now, the the more sideways motion here you have here, the less you really need to worry about keeping your apoapsis up. But right now, I'm not even full thrust, and and the apoapsis is running away from me pretty quick. So, and we're about to be in orbit. Uh, 
the closer, I mean, as long as you're not going to run over your apoapsis, the closer you can be to the apoapsis when you're doing your burn, uh, the more efficient your, your burn is. In other words, the more sideways it's going to be, the more of your thrust is going to be generated sideways as versus trying to keep yourself upright or whatever. So, close, closer you can be to your apoapsis, uh, I need to do an attitude adjustment here. Okay, so I have my RCS on, now I have it off. Uh, closer you can be to the apoapsis uh, when you do your burn, the better. Uh, and so right now, because I'm almost in orbit, uh, I'm really waiting until I get to about 10 seconds. Okay. And see, our, our periapsis, our low point of our, our orbit, is uh, almost, yeah, like right there. So right now we're in orbit. Okay, we are in a roughly circular 73 by 74 thousand meter orbit. And uh, we are in space. Uh, there's no more atmosphere at this at this altitude, uh, so we have no worries about ha it, it, it heat pulling us down down again. Uh, now, what is orbit? Uh, orbit is uh, you're still falling towards the planet, uh, but you're moving so fast horizontally uh, that the, the planet, in in a sense, keeps on moving out of the way. Uh, so you keep on falling in a circle, uh, you're, but your your horizontal movement movement is so fast that you never do you never do fall to the ground. Uh, so that's basically what an orbit is, and then you need a very respectable amount of horizontal velocity to achieve that. So right now our velocity is uh, 22,000, uh, 20, uh, 2,289.9 meters per second. Uh, so that means uh, we are going uh, uh, 2.2 kilometers a second. Uh, so it's pretty fast. And this this is a Kerbin is a smaller planet than Earth, so you know, it's not. Uh, not realistic as far as what, but it would be on Earth. Um, okay, now you may be wondering. Okay, I'm in orbit. Let's, let's suppose suppose I had a human being up here. Uh, I'm in orbit. Okay, it's great. So he's he's out here. He's spacewalking. He's doing his whole astronaut thing. How the fuck does he ever get down? Uh, now this indicator here, prograde. That's the direction that you are traveling in. So this is how we. This is the direction we are traveling in. You can use a little RCS to uh, get straightened up. Uh, so let me hold that thought. Uh, these are this button shows us where our, our all of our resources are. Uh, that's kind of important. Uh, electric charge, uh, liquid fuel. How much fuel we have in the tanks? How much oxidizer? We have to have oxidizer to burn the fuel. How much of that is in the tanks? How much monopropellant? That's RCS. That's something you want to be looking at a lot uh, because um, you can run out if you run out of monopropellant. You can find yourself unable to control your spacecraft. That's not what you want. Uh, okay, so back to what I was saying. Now, let's, uh, suppose I, I, I've I got a man on here, and uh, he's uh, he's out here. He's doing his space thing, and he goes, "Okay, time to go home." How do you go home? Uh, you can't hit the brakes. There's no there's no concrete here for you to to hit the brakes on. What you have to do is uh, you have to uh, go against the direction of your travel. In other words, you have to lose all that speed that you picked up in order to get into orbit to begin with. Uh, this is the direction of our travel, prograde. Uh, let's go ahead and pop on the RCS. And you can see very nicely how the RCS works here. Okay, now this is the retrograde indicator. Let me move it move aside just a second too so you can see a bit better uh, what it looks like. Uh, it's um, uh, looks similar to the prograde indicator, but it has an X in it, and the, the prongs of it, as it were, are in a sort of triangular uh, orientation. So in order to uh, go back to Kerbin, uh, you have to lose all the horizontal speed that you just picked up in order to actually get to orbit. So let's get pointed uh, retrograde. We'll go ahead and do orbit this. Uh, once it settles down, we'll turn off the RCS, and we will use some thrust and start deorbiting. I know we just got to orbit, but there's some other things I want to do in this tut tutorial. Uh, okay. Now, it's, right now, it's showing that uh, that uh, you'll intersect right there. That's not actually where you're going to land because once you get down below 70,000, uh, you're going to be hitting the air. It's going to slow you down. So you actually will land somewhere right around here. Um, so that's important to know if you're wanting to do a water splashdown as versus a land splashdown. Alright, now let's do this with people.
Okay, I'm going to basically replicate this uh, rocket with a person on it. Uh, it'll take me just a minute. Okay, we're going to build our uh, manned spacecraft. <coughs> now, let's see, first thing that we want to be thinking about. Okay, so he's, he's, he's gone and done his space thing, and he's coming hurtling back towards Earth at outrageous speeds. How are you going to stop him? You know, you're going to stop him with a parachute. Don't forget the parachute. Parachute is very important. Safety first. Okay, but one of these uh, radial man mounted parachutes will do just fine. We only need one uh, for someone on this side. This is just a one man capsule. Uh, now you probably want to have control all the way uh, through the flight process, so uh, you're going to want to have a SAS. Let's put that on top. Now you might want to actually dock with something. We're going to pop a docking clamp on that. Uh, and now that's going to block them. That should be perfectly fine as far as um, what the parachute is able to hold up. Um, you don't want to you want to the the capsule to be pretty much by itself when it's coming back, but uh, uh, the SAS and the, the, that is not going to be a big issue, uh, especially for just a one-man capsule. That's the parachute is overpowered for a one-man capsule. Okay, we need a decoupler. We want to be able to separate the capsule from everything else. Uh, parachutes at the top. That's the last thing we deploy. Uh, if we want to be um, extra zealous, we can have the uh, docking thing on a separate. Uh, Decoupler, so it will it will go running away when uh, when the time comes. Okay, uh, now when you get to space, you might want to actually like move around and something. That <laughs> could be useful. Let's go ahead and uh, this one, right? Yeah. Go ahead and give it a little engine. There we go. Let's look at our center of mass. Go ahead and pop in uh, some RCS thruster blocks. Uh, in this case, we're going to put it right at the center of mass. We only need one set for this, really. Okay. Now, if you want to uh, actually power anything up in space, like this light, which uh, lights are very useful in uh, docking, so you can see where you're going, especially on the dark side of the planet. you're going to need to have a source of power and batteries. So let's go ahead and um, pop a couple solar panels on here. We'll do two. Two should be more than sufficient, really. Uh, and batteries. We'll pop two of those on as well. Uh, you may want to see what temperature it is out there. If you want to see what temperature it is on all sides of your spacecraft, we'll go ahead and put four thermometers out there. And do a little science. Uh, you might want a want to be able to detect the gravity. We'll pop a gravity detector in there. I think we can pretty much say that there's no barometric pressure in space, so we don't need that. And over here we'll pop this thing, accelerator, accelerometer. Uh, now in uh, uh, KSP as it is now, there's actually no need to have an antenna on, on this thing. Uh, I just uh, like to have one to show me kind of which way is up, but I got the door for that too, so didn't really need that. Just just to have it there for looks. Uh, there's one more thing that we need for our little runabout in space. That is RCS fuel. Okay. That's our upper stage. We need to have a decoupler to separate that from the rest of the rocket. Okay. I think I had four on the uh, on the core stage of that other one. Uh, and we're going to have the vectoring engine. Now I did notice um, uh, that once the the booster stages had dropped, 
there was a slight down downgrading of our acceleration. Uh, we'll, what we'll do is we'll put some of these vectoring engines here. Those will only kick in. Uh, wait, no, those will only kick in uh, when we drop all the other boosters. Uh, we're also going to need to have some RCS thrusters down here so that we can control it. Okay, there we go. This is actually going to go in a lower stage. Um, okay. Now, uh, radial decouplers. Couplers, there's several different kinds. Um, I like these because they give you a little space between uh, between the core booster and the strap-ons. Uh, just totally up to you. Now, the other there's others who are, that are lighter, uh, and there could be a situation where uh, how light it is uh, can make a difference. Um, but uh, I like these. Okay, and we're using the non-vectoring engine for this. And a little space tape. Okay. A uh, little cap on there to make it pretty. We're using the Alt key to duplicate that and move it over, move the copy over here. And uh, not quite right. That's better. Okay. Okay, now this. Yep. I said this, and all these fire at the same time. Uh, and we're going to set up this as the one that uh, goes second. It connects up to the core booster. And uh, this one as the one that drops first. And that looks highly retarded. Let's do that a different way. Okay. Okay, so uh, at ignition, uh, all of these fire. Uh, this one needs to drop first. So we'll go ahead and click the plus there to open that up. Drop these down here. That's these. Yep. And then those drop. When these drop, we want to have these uh, supplementary engines fire. So we'll just go ahead and move that down to that same stage. And this is our top stage. Now, I haven't done the math yet. I don't know for sure that this is going to get this little guy to orbit. I assume so, though. Because it had plenty of... Had plenty of... Uh, of uh, for that little robotic probe. Of course, the robotic probe was quite a lot lighter. Well, okay. Now, <clears throat> before you uh, go out to the launch pad, uh, a couple things you want to check over. One thing, does it have a parachute? Yes. Does it have an SAS module? Yes. Uh, no, actually, no, I was like, where did I put the SAS module? Did I actually blow off put a lot of the SAS module? But no, we have an SAS module. Uh, does it have um, a means of control? Sort of. Uh, has uh, these uh, RCS tanks, it doesn't have any fins. Let's go ahead and pop some fins on. It's just only good in the atmosphere, but uh, that's not nothing. And these things are pretty light, so. Okay, uh, is our staging correct? Boom, boom, boom. Uh, then this drops, and then this drops. Oh, nope. This drops. Yes. Okay, good. And these fire at the same time. Uh, those little engines are kind of wasteful of fuel, but uh, 
Now, if you, if you need a little extra oomph at some point in your launch profile, it can be good to uh, use. Okay. Okay, and it should be controllable at uh, all stages pretty much of our flight program. And I keep on thinking I'm forgetting something. Which I'm sure we want to get out below. Oh, yes. And we have to have these things because this thing is not going to stand up with that one little thing. So we definitely need to have some launch enhancers here to hold the rocket up while it's on the launch pad. work. Okay, so we're about to commit a tiny little Kerbal life to the void, and we want to pretty much be sure that we're doing the right thing. Uh, yep, yep, parachutes last. Okay, now suppose that um, something goes wrong. We need to get this guy away quickly. Uh, it might be good if you want to be responsible about keeping those precious little Kerbals alive if you have an abort system. Um, and you can set up your abort system on the action groups. Now, if you click on abort, uh, in this case we're going to click on this, decouple, uh, and this uh, toggle. So it'll, uh, it'll separate and fire to get it away from the cluster frack that may be ensuing uh, when I actually have to use that, which hopefully I won't. Okay, now there's also another thing which you may want to consider. Uh, this does add weight, uh, but you know, sometimes uh, some of the, some of those uh, decouples are pretty close things as far as not hitting the rocket. Uh, so we may want to put some separatrons. Separatrons are to um, help keep your get your um, your boosters uh, away from the core rocket when you're separating. Uh, now you don't want to have these things pointed at the core rocket. In other words, we could stick this here uh, if we do that, uh, but this is it's going to be blasting right on our core ro rocket. It could damage it, could even destroy it. Uh, so we want to have it sort of separated out a little bit like that. Uh, and if you're going to do this, you need to have separate pairs. I usually try to avoid separatrons because they do do actually weigh something. These weigh uh, 0.2, which you may think, oh, that's nothing. It's something, you know. It, it makes a difference. Uh, could be. It could even make a difference between this thing making orbit and not making orbit. Uh, but we'll go ahead and uh, put some separatrons on here. <laughs> also, uh, uh, you can actually uh, cause uh, your problems to be worse with separatrons if you're not careful. Uh, so just be aware of those things. You can actually use separatrons to cause your boosters to collide with the uh, rocket. So you just have to be. Have to be careful. Okay, and we have to have those set up to fire at the same time as these. So okay, this is the first one, and these separatrons need to go up there, right? Yep. Uh, sometimes um, KSP will divide up your parts in a weird way. You may have to go hunting for. Uh, stray parts like that one. So just be aware of that. Okay. And it has put the this thing in exactly the wrong spot. Uh, the uh, uh, why it separates that out, I don't know. Uh, it, but it's put that in the absolute wrong stage. It has it has no intuition as far as where things should go. Uh, okay. Now this stage here, uh, I need to have these separatrons on. And again, uh, separatrons can be a two-edged sword. Generally speaking, I won't use them unless uh, it just absolutely will collide with the rest of the spacecraft unless I use them. Uh, they can be very entertaining to watch, though. Uh, okay, so. Uh, la 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 Okay. Uh, now I have a docking port up here. I don't have anything to dock it with, I don't think. I have another spacecraft up there, but I'm not, not going to bother docking with it for right now. Um, 
but, but uh, it's a good thing to have one because you may build a space station later and want this rocket to go meet up with it or something. So, uh, docking ports are good to have, and they are <coughs> pretty cheap as far as weight goes, 0 0.05. So, they do have this one that has a dome on it, has a uh, has a uh, nose cone on it that you can uh, retract. Uh, it weighs more and doesn't seem to have any kind of really a, a added functionality. So, it's good. Uh, okay, this is the Wind boat one. Okay, and have I screwed something up totally? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Previous one. Well, I know no, not great deal more, but it's carrying more weight than the previous one, so there's no guarantee this will get to orbit. If it doesn't get to orbit, then you have to adapt things uh, accordingly. But I think it probably will get to orbit. Maybe. Could be. Possibly. Okay. And we have Jebediah. Hey, Jebediah. Uh, going to space again. Pop open our resources. Turn our headlights on. And three, two, one, go. Okay, working on the second tank of the uh, first booster. And we'll soon be able to see the Sepatrons in action. Like I say, I rarely use them, but uh, I'll use them here just for grins. And that worked perfectly. Okay, and at 13,000 meters, um, we're going to um, uh, do our gravity turn. There's, there's nothing magic about the number 13,000, uh, but we want to get uh, high, high enough to sort of lessen the impact of gravity, uh, and yet still get it, start getting horizontal uh, early enough in the flight program. So. on our gravity turn now and we have good control because we have that center center engine that has a uh, thrust vectoring it's gim it's on a gimbal uh, so as long as that engine is going we don't have to worry about even using RCS to steer it'll still steer perfectly fine without it okay our gravity turn is completed I turn basically halfway uh, on a heading of 90 degrees I turn sort of halfway down at a 45 degree angle to the ground basically okay let's take a look at our map uh, there's a key that you can use to pop up this thing. It's very useful to have. Uh, we're getting a lot of altitude, uh, not getting in quite as much horizontal velocity as we might like. Uh, so when we get to 50,000, we're going to go ahead and tilt over a little bit more. Uh, that like that. Because uh, really at this stage, it's all about the horizontal velocity. Uh, we're going to we're going to get to orbit. Uh, not, we're going to get have an apogee above. 70,000, put it that way. Uh, so that's not a worry. Um, what is a worry is whether we're going to get actually have orbit. So we're actually going to have enough sideways horizontal uh, velocity to make orbit. And there's no necessity to have an orbit that's higher than about 70,000. Uh, you can if you want to, but there's no absolute necessity to have an orbit that's higher than 70,000. Things are pretty look pretty cool though. If you're in an extreme orbit, like a million million meters out, uh, the the planet looks quite small. Okay, we're almost at seventy thousand meters. Seventy. Okay, and uh, what we're looking for is uh, this number to be at, uh, t minus uh, about forty five. Okay, now I'm going to try to steer it over. As you can tell, it's very very hard to uh, maneuver. It's a little bit easier than it was before because the uh, a capsule actually has a certain amount of um, gyroscopic SAS force to it, so it's actually a little bit easier with the man capsule. Okay, we need to go ahead and start thrusting out. Okay, and I need to drop that. <laughs> and one thing I will say about the Sephatrons is they're very cinematic.
and we are sucking down the fuel big time. We may have to go on to the um, the uh, last stage engine to get to orbit. Uh, and we're above seventy thousand. Yeah, see, at this point, I don't have to use a whole lot of thrust to uh, to keep my apoapsis ahead of me. You always want to have your apoapsis ahead of you, otherwise it's possible that you wouldn't make orbit, or that your the low part of your part of your orbit would be in the atmosphere, which would bring you eventually bring you all the way down, which you don't want. Okay, we got a periapsis now of twenty one thousand. Almost, almost there. That's a uh, periapsis of 68,000. Now, depending on what kind of scenario you're playing, uh, it can be um, uh, good to question what the hell you're going to do with this tank when you're done with it, because the tank's in orbit. <laughs> so, uh, so it's um, it's going to stay in orbit essentially perpetually. Uh, so, um, if you're if you're trying to be realistic about things, uh, you may want to consider how you're going to deorbit stuff. Uh, but if you're just now getting to orbit or you're having some issues, that's not something you need to worry about right now because you're, you, the odds of being uh, hit um, uh, by debris is really relatively small. Uh, okay, we are in orbit. Okay. Let's go ahead and go over to the sunlight side before we have uh, Jebediah come out and take a bow. And we got some, some space debris out here. Uh, that's going into deep space, apparently. Yeah, the uh, the thing about not running into de debris, even more so if it's if the debris is uh, is um, heading out into solar orbit, you'll you'll never run into it. Uh, now it could it could kind of bog down your game to have it there, and it's obviously not aesthetically desirable to have it there, but it's not uh, it's not going to be a problem of any kind. Uh, now one answer to what I do with this thing is uh, I could actually use it to deorbit the capsule. Uh, the problem with that is that if I want to um, uh, want to dock this with something. Uh, having this whole thing back here makes things a little bit more cumbersome. Uh, you can also put a a, a AI, a computer brain, on this thing, uh, which will allow you to control it after you separate it from this. Uh, so, um, uh, so in other words, I could separate it from this, and then I could tell this thing to go deorbit itself while this thing goes on its happy way. Uh, so that's a very useful thing to have, a very, very useful thing to know about and to do. Uh, and again, but if, if you're if you're just starting out and you haven't been to the moon yet and all that jazz, uh, don't even worry about deorbiting your own job because in all likelihood it's not going to be a problem. It's just something for people like me who want to add some challenge to things uh, uh, that want to uh, to make things a little more challenging. And that's uh, something that you can do is make sure that you know where your junk is going and be a responsible citizen and deorbit it. Okay, let's let's uh, let's get uh, Jebediah uh, out here. Let's get the spacecraft kind of pointed in a good direction here. Uh, Jebediah out here and, and let him take a walk. Let him take a space walk. Uh, this is actually maneuvering pretty well uh, on just the uh, gyroscopic SAS in the capsule right now. 
that's one difference between a robotic rocket uh, and a uh, manned rocket is this thing does have some uh, what's called gyroscopic SAS in it that allows you to maneuver your rocket a little bit a little bit more easily if it's not too too huge. Uh, now, if you're trying to steer a moon rocket, uh, it may your your mileage may vary. Uh, all right, well, let's uh, let's I hope I hope this is not going to impede the pat the hatch. I've had a had an issue where if you impede impede this patch in any anyway, it'll actually project the astronaut out into, out into space quite a distance. Uh, so hopefully that's not going to be a problem today. Well, sort of. Okay. And now spacewalking. I've got Jebediah out here. Uh, what am I going to do with him? Um, first thing is, if you want to get pointed in a good direction, uh, you use your your normal uh, movement keys. Uh, like the, the steering, steering keys you would normally use. Uh, but most of the time you're going to use your translational keys. Uh, I would tell you what those are, except that I have my, my thing set up, set up different. Uh, but you look, if you look in the, um, the key bindings, uh, it'll tell you what the translational uh, keys are. Uh, and uh, that's for, uh, for going uh, left, right, uh, up, down, forward, and back. Uh, and what I've done is um, uh, I've actually set it up to where, um, it, to me, it's it's more like the um, translation translational controls on the uh, rockets. Uh, if I, if you think about this as the head of Jebediah here, and that's his feet, um, that's the way I have, have the um, the, ro the um, rocket set up and the and the jetpack set up both, so that they 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 feel more um, more similar to each other, and it's a little easier for me to. to um, do it that way. Um, I would think of that as the head of the rocket and that's the back of the rocket. Let's see if we can uh, he's walking on the rocket. He's having himself a little walk. And everything is very stable. Unfortunately, there's no fine controls for the uh, for the jetpack. That's unfortunate. <laughs> He's riding it like a cowboy. That's his that's his horse, riding a bronco. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's all for this tutorial. Now, there's going to be other tutorials uh, soon to come, uh, and uh, I may even record those tonight. What time is it? Um, and uh, so that's my rocket design tutorial. Uh, the two things that you need to be thinking about. Uh, first, power. If you don't have the power, you're not going to get space. And it's just simple as that. And that's a matter of the, uh, the thrust to weight ratio. Uh, secondly, it's all well and good to have the power. If you don't have control over it, you're not going to go where you want to go. And you have to have, be able to control your attitude in all phases of your launch profile, not just you know, not just in the atmosphere, not just in space, but in all phases of your launch profile, you have to have control over your positive control, like I don't have right now. <laughs> positive control over your spacecraft. Oh, because I have this SAS. On. Never mind. So uh, you have to have uh, power and control. Power enough power to get the thing up there control enough, enough ability to direct it where you want it to go. Uh, that's it for this tutorial, and uh, next time I'm going to probably do a little tutorial on docking, because uh, that's something that gives people people, people trouble as well. Uh, I'm going to send up two of these rockets. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to put a brain on this thing to um, allow me to deorbit this uh, when I'm ready to separate. Um, I'm going to dock, I'm going to rendezvous two of these um, spacecraft in orbit. Uh, I'm going to show you how that's done. Uh, and then uh, probably in the third tutorial, we're going to move on to the moon. Move to the moon. All right, then. See you next time.